Hi, boys and girls. I'm over here. Breathe in that fresh air. It feels great being outside, surrounded with living things, even in the middle of a wheat field and with a squeaking windmill behind me. Welcome to my summer read-along show. As you can see, I've just finished reading the first 100 pages of The Evolution of Calpurnia Tate by Jacqueline Kelly. Actually, I read to page 111. I got so wrapped up in the story, I couldn't help reading ahead. I'll try not to give anything away. I can't wait to tell you about all the neat things we're going to do today. First off, I'll be sharing some strategies to help you maneuver your way through this wonderful story. We'll take a look at some cool photos and show you how to bind your own field journal. But that's not all. We're taking a field trip. So kids, get your bug spray ready. All right, let's begin. What did you think of the first 100 pages? All I can say is, wow, there was just so much to think about. The yellow grasshopper, the bat story, the hummingbird incident, the Texas heat, and then the opossum that lived on the outer wall of Callie's bedroom, not to mention all of Callie's frustrations. And I'll confess, she stole my heart. But as I read the story, I came across many unfamiliar words. You probably did too. So I began to log my words, ideas, and phrases, sort of like a list of things to think about and maybe look up later on. Here's my list. And what I've done is created a code for myself. So a V stands for vocabulary, a check for detailed descriptions, an asterisk for interesting facts, stars, ideas for myself, like predictions or just things that I want to think about as I read. Two stars, quoted material that I thought was kind of well written, question mark, what I don't know, things that I'm curious about. So here's my words, ideas, and phrases I want to think about from pages 1 to 111. But you can see what I did. And I don't have to mark everything up, just some things that I really am not sure about. If you haven't made a list yet, you may want to start one now. There was so much to think about in the first reading. So instead of worrying about the things that you didn't understand, think about what you did understand. You may want to go back and see just how many questions you can now answer. And if you're still confused about the quotes at the beginning of each chapter, well, it's from Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And our author, Jacqueline Kelly, uses it to sort of like give a preview of what's to come in her chapters. She tries to use that material to make a connection between the issue of living things in our world and the events in her story. A very clever writing style, I might add. And finally, was there anything that surprised you? What surprised me was that I thought I would dislike the grandfather. But it turned out he was one of my favorite characters next to Callie. Maybe you felt the same way. What makes the story so unique is that it is packed with scientific names. Here are a few photos of living things Callie encounters. Here's a picture of a cuttlefish. The grandfather referred to it as the beast in the jar. Now I can see why. The cuttlefish is actually a marine animal and is not considered a fish. Instead, it's a type of mollusk. This sea creature has no outer shell. It grows a special shell inside its body called a cuddle bone. They measure about 10 inches, and its eyes resemble the letter W, and most frequently referred to as the chameleon of the sea. Besides that, guess what? They're edible. Delicious. And I'm sure you've seen these pesty worms. In our story, Callie refers to them as web worms. We call them tent caterpillars. Clusters of them live in large silk webs anchored to tree branches. These worms are capable of defoliating entire forests. A hummingbird's nest is a rare find. It is often mistaken for a tree knot. The nests are tiny, measuring about one and a half inches and inside the diameter is almost the size of a walnut shell. As you may imagine, the eggs are so tiny they could probably be compared to jelly beans. By the way, if you actually find a hummingbird's nest, 
you should leave it alone, as the bird may want to reuse its nesting materials. These migratory birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, so by all means look, but don't touch. Wolf spiders range between one and a half to two inches in length. Their colors are brown or gray. The mother typically carries the egg sac around with her. When the young spiderlings hatch, they climb aboard and stay on her back until they are almost grown. These spiders are not poisonous, though certain people may have a localized reaction to their bite. Damselflies are flying or aerial insects with slender, graceful bodies mostly found in shallow and freshwater habitats. Their wings are delicate, filmy, and net-veined. One way to distinguish the damselfly from the dragonfly is by their thinner, needle-like abdomens. Their colors are stunning and vivid. While wing spans among the 2,600 damselfly species range from as little as under one inch to about seven and a half inches, as in the giant damselfly, found in tropical areas of Central and South America. The gossamer winged butterfly is the second largest family of butterflies with about 600 species worldwide. Their bright, delicate, shimmering wings consist of blue and copper hues, including hair streaks, sunbeams, and harvesters. And in general, they have a metallic gloss. Their size is about five centimeters, while in their larva stage, some of these butterflies depend on ants for protection. Carrion beetles are generally known as the burying beetle because they are associated with the disposal and recycling of dead small animals. These beneficial black or orange insects measure anywhere from one and a half inches to half an inch. They can move the body of a small dead animal to a suitable burying place. There, they take away the soil from under the animal and bury it. The beetles then lay their eggs on the body and their larvae feed on it. Speaking of which, what exactly did the grandfather do to send Minerva reeling from his library? Poor Harry, but it was probably for the best. Could it be that he showed her his beetle collection? Maybe she was grossed out by it all. I don't really know for sure, but that part was certainly very funny. Or maybe the armadillo did her in. Well, I hope I've left you with lots of things to think about. Up next is making a simple bound field journal. Here's what you'll need. Embroidery thread, any color that you like. Five sheets of computer paper. A large handheld needle. Scissors. A marker. A pencil. A ruler some sheets of construction paper, again any color that you like, and some glue. And basically what you're going to do is take your sheets of computer paper and you're going to place corner to corner and press very, very hard, maybe push your fingernail against it to make a very sharp edge, a fold. And you're going to do it five times until you've done all five sheets, corner to corner, and press it as tight as you can. When you've completed that, you're going to place them one inside the other, just like I've done here. Straighten them out, and then set your ruler right up against the inner part and you're going to find two inches and put a little dot. Three and a half inches and another little dot. Five inches and six and a half inches. As you can tell, they're about one and a half inches intervals. Then take your handheld needle and poke a hole. You can actually poke one hole, the holes, a sheet at a time or you can gather them all at the same time and poke right through. I have a piece of cardboard here so I can actually penetrate the needle right through the paper. Make sure that this part, you've done a good job with it. Then, the thread actually just has to be three times. One, two, and three times the width 
of the construct computer paper. Make a knot at the end after you've threaded it, and now you're ready. Go to the back and place the needle in the back hole and come right up through. That's your first hole, like so. Then go down the second hole and out and pull it nice and tight, like so. And now back in on your third hole and place it right through. You may want to hold on to it because it does move around as you can see. Back up, third hole, and right down into your second hole. And then what you want to do is tie it off. So you can cut your thread, that was pretty easy, and then you can pull it really tightly. Okay, all right, and so you have your stitched journal. Take your favorite color, construction paper, same thing. You're going to fold it corner to corner, make a sharp edge, place it inside, fold it back a little bit, take your glue stick or any kind of glue and just make a little X, some lines. and press it down. And you can, if you wish, put some glue on the other side as well. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. And don't worry about it being perfect, okay? This is for you to have fun with it. And so here is your journal. Here is one. Here is another one that I've made. And then here is mine, because now what you want to do is take your marker, as you can see what I wrote, and you're simply going to write whatever you want, but I call it my field journal. Let's take a look inside of mine. So, I have a little title page inside and actually a dedication page. And here's my first entry. I have my date, June 29th, 2010, around 5 p.m. Location, my side yard. And sketch, it's those little white butterflies, about two inches wide, and I put lots of details. It was actually hovering over a, a plant which is called a cat mint, moving very, very rapidly, collecting its nectar. Here's another one that I did. This is on June 30th. Location, rock garden. Sketch, some type of beetle. Well, I didn't know what it was, but I did look it up and discovered that it's a potato beetle. Kind of pretty. And then July 1st, location was actually my garage door. I sketched, which he looks pretty big. It's a juvenile grasshopper about one inch long, and I know that they get bigger throughout the summer. But he had two brown stripes down the side. So this is what you can do. You can make your own field guide. All you need to do is log the date, location, and sketch. This journal will certainly come in handy when we go on our field trip to the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed in Pennington, New Jersey.